how SpaceX creates a new Raptor engine every 24 hours. The SpaceX Starship program's heart and soul is the Raptor engine. The largest rocket in the world was propelled into space and beyond by 30 beating hearts. With a total of 36 Raptor boost engines per Starship stack, SpaceX has had a lot of pressure to produce a lot of these engines in a short amount of time so that they can travel to the moon and eventually the planet Mars. Making space travel accessible and affordable in order to someday enable the human race to colonize other planets has really emerged as one of SpaceX's most important goals. The engineers at SpaceX are performing well despite the strain. They've already managed to increase Raptor engine production to the pace of one per day, which is unheard of in the world of rocket engines, but that's still not enough. Elon Musk has stated that he expects SpaceX to produce between two and four Raptor engines per day, seven days a week, or between 800 and 1,000 Raptor vehicles per year. So let's discuss how SpaceX is achieving that. The major advantage the Raptor engine's large volume production rate affords SpaceX engineers is the opportunity to quickly iterate and improve on their design, not only accumulating enough of them to fly 1,000 starships to Mars, at least not yet. The way Elon Musk puts it there is more freedom you have to try new things because even if it goes wrong and explodes, that doesn't really matter because you know you've got a bunch of engines coming after. But if you make a small number of engines, you have to be more conservative with your design iterations because you can't risk blowing them up. Elon says that SpaceX has blown up probably around 30 Raptor engines, likely more. For example, the Raptor of today, version 2, is an entirely different product from the first Raptors that were flown just over two years ago. The Raptor 2 is using significantly fewer parts than version 1, so much so that SpaceX was able to shave 400 kilograms of total weight off the engine. A Raptor now comes in at 1,600 kilograms total weight, and at the same time, they were actually able to increase the thrust by upping the combustion chamber pressure from 250 to 300 bar. That pushed the thrust from 185 tons to 230 tons. If we can assume that we were constructing one of these Raptor engines in its current known condition, it might be easier to conceive of working from the top down. Elon Musk believes there is still room to crank the Raptor up to 250 tons of thrust at 330 bar of pressure. The gimbal mechanism would be your first significant component. Although only approximately half of the Raptors will have one of these, it is a hydraulic motor that can be angled up to 15 degrees. Elon Musk has said that SpaceX will eventually replace the hydraulic drive with a screw-type electric motor, and that's likely a change that we'll see implemented over the next year. Moving to electric will greatly simplify the Starship design and production, making it lighter and cheaper to build. Is where we get into the oxygen power head. The oxidizer inlet pipe actually flows straight down through the gimbal and into the first stage of the pump, which is an inducer, and then it attaches with two impeller stages below. This is our primary pump mechanism from there. The oxygen is hitting a pre-burner, which is just a very small rocket engine that's built into the power head. By a cross connection, this will mix in a little amount of the methane fuel before being ignited with a torch. In order to speed the oxidizer through the nozzle of the pre-burner and into the turbine, where the pressurized exhaust from the pre-burner spins up the turbine and powers the inducer and impeller stage, only a small amount of the oxidizer will be burned. If that all sounds out of order, that's because it is the turbine needs to spin to operate the pump, but the pump needs to send gas into the turbine, so SpaceX actually uses an external mechanism built into the launch mount. That will spin start all of the gas turbines at the same time on a regular rocket. You would have a pressurized onboard that would do the same job. But SpaceX is obsessed with simplification and getting as many components out of the Starship as possible. Exiting the turbine, now gaseous oxygen is going to continue flowing straight down into the fuel injector. It's very important to the Raptor design that the oxidizer flows in a straight vertical path from the top to the bottom of the engine. About 78 of the combustion is fueled by the oxidizer. Our methane power head will therefore be flowing in parallel off to the side of the main body where we want to observe the most flow. This achieves the same results as the oxidizer system. Gaseous methane that has been supplied into the side of the fuel injector through a pipe will be discharged by the pump, preburner, and turbine. The two hot gases are mixed in the Raptor's swirl injection system before being steamed into the combustion chamber. The oxidizer is coming straight down through a metal pipe, and there are going to be a ton of little holes drilled into the side of that pipe 
where the methane gas will be pumped in the flow of methane. The side of the pipe is going to create a swirling motion as the two elements combine and make their final approach. In the combustion chamber in there, the gas mixture is going to combust. Elon Musk has specifically said that SpaceX has been able to delete the torch igniter from the combustion chamber on the Raptor 2, so we have no idea how that combustion happens, but it does. Below that is going to be a point where the metal is compressed down to a very narrow opening that is the throat pushing the exhaust from the combustion through that small opening is going to create a very large amount of pressure. The Raptor runs at 300 bar of pressure or about 4300 psi in the combustion chamber. Because energy prefers to flow from areas of high pressure to areas of low pressure, the engine nozzle expands from the narrow throat to the very wide base. It will cause the exhaust gas to rapidly accelerate as it exits, converting combustion energy to kinetic energy that will propel the rocket into the sky. So those are the major components of the Raptor engine that Elon Musk has revealed thus far, as well as how they all fit together. The majority of these metal components and housings will be made of SX-500, a special alloy developed by SpaceX. It's made of copper, aluminium, and steel. Elon has said that this metal is devised for high strength at extreme temperatures and extreme oxidation resistance. It can hold up to 12,000 psi of pressure and survive the super hot oxygen rich gas that flows through the middle of the Raptor body. Most of these castings are going to be connected together by heavy flanges with heavy bolts. For now, at least Elon does want to eliminate as many flanges from the engine design as possible and instead move to more welded interfaces. Anytime that you're working with threaded fasteners in an environment with a lot of pressure and temperature variation and vibration, there's going to be a potential for failure. The Raptor is extremely difficult to seal, and preventing leaks is equally difficult, so that problem remains unsolved. There will also be a small number of 3D printed components in the engine. This may come as a surprise, but Elon wants to eliminate as much of that process as possible. 3D printing on the Raptor is a good technology, but it limits the ability to scale up manufacturing manufacturing in this application. It raises costs and slows down production. If this all sounds fairly simple in construction, that's very much on purpose. The goal with the Raptor is to get the cost of production down as much as possible, and the speed up as much as possible. Elon's primary goal is for the Raptor's cost per ton of thrust to be less than $1,000. As a result, each engine must cost no more than $250,000. All of this engine building is taking place at the SpaceX facility in McGregor, Texas. It is approximately halfway between Dallas and Austin. Since SpaceX inception in the early 2000s, this has been its primary engine testing ground. This is where the first Merlin engines and the early Falcon prototypes were all tests flown. For the first time, the McGregor site has a lot of history. It was originally a bomb factory in World War II, then it was used by Aerojet Rocketdyne to test rocket engines in the 60s and 70s, then it went back to the munitions industry for a while before returning to use as a rocket testing ground for a company called a Beale Aerospace. In the late 90s, they were trying to develop the most powerful engine since the old F1 from the Saturn V moon rocket. They failed, and that led Elon Musk to scoop up the place and bring it into the 21st century of aerospace design up until now. SpaceX built all of the Raptor engines in California before shipping them to McGregor for testing. They secured the engine to a test stand and fired it up to see what would happen. Sometimes it explodes, and sometimes it just melts. But the Raptors that survive are sent south to Starbase for installation in a Starship or Super Heavy Booster prototype. Obviously, it would be more efficient to build the engines in the same location where they are tested. Not only does that eliminate a long-haul truck journey across half the country, but it also helps to speed up the iteration process that we've been talking about. Now SpaceX engineers can try a new idea on the Raptor design immediately. Strap it to the test firing rig and see what happens. Return to production line and make additional adjustments. This will accelerate Raptor development and improvement, bringing the company closer to its super ambitious goal of building between two and four Raptor engines per day. 
For context, NASA signed a $1.2 billion deal with Aerojet Rocketdyne to build new RS-25 engines for the SLS rocket that will carry out Artemis moon launches for the next decade, with the goal of producing four engines per year. That is definitely on the slower end of the scale, but still much more indicative of the rocket engine manufacturing business than what SpaceX is trying to accomplish. Here it's going to be absolutely unprecedented, and we get to come along for the ride. Let us know if you think it's really possible to build 1,000 rocket engines in a year to power a fleet of 1,000 starships in the next decades if you found this video informative today. That would be insane. Don't forget to give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. This is critical for getting our content it in front of more people.